and welcome back. One of the, uh, the uh, rewarding things for me is to watch other doctors filter in this information, take it in and filter it, and uh, based upon their experiences and careers to make other decisions in life as far as the practice of medicine. And uh, along the way, I've met a few doctors who have uh, had a lot of experience, had a lot of doctor-patient relationships, and have had an awful lot of the frustrations that I've had about why, wanting to be a good doctor. I mean, after all, the reason we all went to medical school was to help people. A, a doctor is the greatest opportunity to help our fellow human beings. And even though the intentions are really good and sometimes we do a lot of good along the way, there seems to be something missing. And every once in a while I get to capture a new mind and I get to share with them uh, a little bit about how I think uh, things ought to be done from a certain point of view. And then they take these years of experience that they've gathered in their doctor-patient relationships and they bring it into our program and greatly enhance our program. And our next speaker is one of those gentlemen who I've had a chance to get to know over the last three years who has actually become part of the McDougal staff. And when you come to some of our programs, our next speaker will be your primary care doctor and he will take care of you, uh, similar to the McDougal philosophy with his background, of course, very much as the foundation of uh, what he teaches and how he cares for patients. And this is how we grow. And so I'm very excited to uh, bring to the stage a, uh, another member, not a new member, of the McDougal program, the McDougal staff who takes care of patients at our, our various programs. I'd like to welcome Dr. Don Forrester, my friend. To share with you. Hey, Don. Have a nice time. Thank you, thank you John. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to speak at the Advanced Study Weekend. I think over the last five years, I've probably made every one of these, uh, either by internet or coming down in person. Of course, person in person is always better because you always meet such fabulous and interesting people when you're here. Uh, what I'd like to do today, my objective, is to give you some information and some concepts that will help you navigate an increasing, confusingly, an increasingly confusing and complex world, but also to, to improve your health as well. Um, and then finally, I'd like to add my presentation to the other speakers that have done what they've done at the Advanced Study Weekend, because it's one of the highlights of the year when I get to hear other speakers. It's also a little intimidating. I think I'm one of the only people that's ever spoken here that doesn't have a book or a DVD. So, topic today is curing United States healthcare. A little bit about my background. I learned to solve problems in my chemical engineering training, applying science and, and, and uh, mathematics to uh, problems. I learned the craft of my medicine at Georgetown University Medical School when I served my family medicine residency up in Sacramento, California. I took my craft and started practicing that with Kaiser Permanente for over 30 years. I was very proud to work for that organization, which has an incredible amount of potential. Uh, along the way, I had several leadership positions, chief of preventive medicine. I ran a family medicine department with 36 physicians. I built and ran for 10 years a multi-specialty clinic with two outpatient ORs where we built a quality improvement, a culture built on quality improvement and frontline empowerment. Along the way, I took those jobs very seriously. I became a certified physician executive and also a quality improvement expert. I'm a proud graduate of the advanced training program in Intermountain Healthcare. From a physician standpoint, the last three years of my practice with Kaiser, although I had always been interested in prevention, was sort of a turning point in my life. A friend gave us a copy of the China study. Uh, my wife and I went plant-based a little over six years ago. Uh, I heard Neil Barnard, the president for Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine speak. I started using his book with my patients. My patients started curing their type 2 diabetes. I started giving talks to doctors. Doctors started having me give more talks to them, and I started giving talks to lay people. So that's sort of how I ended up here. And I do in my encore career, because I left Kaiser about five and a half years ago, took early retirement. So I'm in my encore career. I'm tired of getting, telling people I'm retired. I'm not retired, actually. Uh, <laughs> so I do some writing and presentations as a change agent. But uh, so let's get started. The presentation has three parts. First, we're going to do a diagnosis, because I'm a doctor. Second, we're going to take a little bit of a tour through what quality means in the 20th century. Then I'm going to offer a prescription for government organizations, medical organizations, and get back to the individuals. And we'll see a couple patient clips. And 
We'll probably have time for a couple questions. But if we don't, I brought my cards. I, I left them down here on the front. You can pick up a card. You can email me if you don't get a chance to ask a question. I will not get back to you as fast as John McDougall does. <laughs> nobody, nobody, if it, you've had email contact with John, nobody gets back to you faster than John McDougall does. Of course, if the wind speeds at the right uh, area, he's off uh, windsurfing. So. But other than that, he's, he gets back to you very quickly. So let's diagnose this first. We do not get much value from our health care dollar. You've already heard speakers this weekend talk about that. We're ranked first in spending in the world and 37th out of 191 countries. And it has a great financial impact on families and individuals. In my opinion, 90% of this is waste. And I can prove that 80% of it is avoidable. So that's my message. If you look at the causes of death, I've highlighted some. Uh, you might be surprised by number three, medical care. Uh, when previous speaker uh, talked about number of deaths, uh, Dr. Greger, he included just adverse drug reactions. This includes all of them. This information came out of two landmark studies by the Institute of Medicine called To Air is Human and Crossing the Quality Chasm that came out in about 2001. Uh, the Institute of Medicine just in in put out a very large study now called better care at lower cost, but the interesting thing in reading through that long document, not one mention was made of either primary or secondary prevention, and we'll define that for you in a minute. But all these other highlighted disorders, cardiovascular disease, cancer, stroke, chronic respiratory, diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease, all nutritionally related. And we'll get back to this slide later. But since we all have the same destination in life, correct? And we would like to delay that as long as possible, it's, it's, it's also more about quality of life. And if you look at the leading 10 causes of disability in this country, one out of every five adults is disabled by one or some combinations of these. So all of these disorders are nutritionally related. So it's not only about death, but it's also about disability. So if you look at chronic conditions, we pay over 75% of our health care costs. I actually believe that number is a little higher. But we pay 75% of our health care costs for chronic, treating chronic disease. If you just look at diabetes, which is expensive and prevalent, these chronic diseases just tend to beget other conditions like almost half the new cases of kidney failure, lower leg amputations, increased heart attack strokes, and leading cause of blindness. So the definitions you need to understand for today's talk is primary prevention. Let's look at it from a diabetes standpoint, because we'll talk a little bit about diabetes today, because I am a doctor and that's what I do. But Primary prevention is your sugar is 90, which is considered normal now, and you do not become diabetic. That's primary prevention. Secondary prevention, you'll hear a clip later today in my talk, you'll have a guy who's diabetic who took his sugars down to normal and on no medication. That's secondary prevention. Tertiary prevention is the treatment and control of complications with drugs or procedures. Doctors get this confused all the time. They'll talk about statins as primary or secondary preventive agents. My my feeling is if you're on a drug, you're not cured. You know, so that's tertiary prevention. We're going to talk today about primary and secondary prevention. So medicine is charged off, as you know, in this room, because you're informed citizens, into tertiary prevention. It, this is 2008 data, and it's gotten worse since then. But 25% of people over the age of 65 are on five or more medications. Scarier number is under age 21, 25% are on a chronic medication. Now, that's guys like John and me. We write prescriptions. We're not surgeons, you know, but the surgeons haven't been left out of this whole equation either. I use some bizarro cartoons, not because this is a humorous topic, but just because we have to, have to put in a little humor here. Um, but if you look for the two, 2007 data, we did uh, almost 2 million cardiac bypass and angioplasties. We say, spent over $100 billion, and we killed 27,000 people. Now, those people, by definition, just die in the first month after their procedure. John Glenn, who recently died, for those of you who are aware, he died after his cardiac bypass surgery three months later. He wouldn't have been counted in these statistics. We've got other conditions here that could be uh, avoided as well. So what this gives us, basically, is a mopping up medical care system. Here's a slide courtesy of Hans Diehl, the founder of the CHIP program. So you've got everybody mopping up the floor, but nobody's turning off the spigots, right? What this has led to is a tragedy of our health commons. Most people, if, if you've heard about the concept of the tragedy of the commons, commons were uh, things like air and fish and water and things we have in common. I view health of the community as a commons. 
Uh, Garrett Hardin is the one who talked about the, popularized the concept of, in an article in Science called The Tragedy of Our Commons, but it was actually published by uh, William Lloyd back in 1833, uh, two lectures on the control of populations. But here's the take home message. You have a meadow, which is the commons, and you have maybe four or five sheep herders out there. And it's to each sheep herder's advantage to add a single sheep to their flock. But if all the sheep herders keep pursuing that sort of approach, the meadow will die. So the commons will die. So as we're pursuing all this tertiary care, basically the commons of our health is suffering. So as uh, my previous uh, speaker uh, <laughs> said, physicians are out there struggling. And I know we have some physicians in the audience and nurses. All healthcare professions are struggling. And there are a lot of reasons for this. Uh, there's an incredible amount of literature, Dr. Greger, who I do blog support for and I follow on a regular basis. He reads 12,000 articles and cones them down into the most important articles. John McDougall, I read all his literature because John reads all the medical literature for fun and he cones it down into meaningful and puts it in the right context. So physicians have to have ways to keep up and keep current and there's just no way they can know. Uh, they, 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 they treat patients with drugs so they don't see them get better and all you people who have taken really good care of yourself and are really healthy, you never see your doctor so the doctor doesn't get feedback about some of this stuff and even when you give them the feedback they sometimes don't believe you or they, uh, they, they run into some problems that, the, that Dr. Goslin talked about. They, they focus on controlling markers, not curing disease. They work in poorly designed systems that are not based on the best science. They have the lack of non-clinical skills like quality improvement and statistics that they need, interpersonal skills like uh, collaboration. None of that's taught in medical school. And we've got studies to show that physicians who actually practice good, healthy lifestyles tend to recommend that more to patients. They also have better credibility, and they are also more successful in some of the studies out of England when they do that. So the physicians are struggling. So let's take a tour about quality. Back in the late 1800s, if you wanted something done, you would go to a craftsman, they would do some measurements, they would give you a single item. So it was single piece manufacturing, you had variable quality, and it was high cost. And if there was a problem in the quality, the craftsman solved that problem. Well, in the early 1900s, we got into assembly lines. Ford Motor Company is an example. Uh, there was a businessman named Taylor who came up with a Taylor man management theory and basically you had assembly lines of Henry Ford was famous to say you can have any color Ford you want as long as it was black. So there was low variety and th there's a division of labor and management solves problems. So you had the frontline assembly workers and management was solving the problems. What that gives you as companies get a little larger and some of you may have worked in organizations like this where you've got sort of a bureaucracy, a layered bureaucracy here. You got the people working on the front line, you got a layer of management, you got a lot of other people, then you've got the top person at the top. And the trouble is companies get bigger and you get into these sort of arrangements, they breed politicians, not leaders. And the definition is politicians tend to want to hold on to their positions. The best definitions I've ever seen for leadership are leaders find parades and get in front of them. <laughs> Today's parade is people do not want to take drugs, they want health. They don't want procedures, they want health. That's the parade. Leaders get in front of it. The trouble is if you're a leader and you don't get in front of the parade, one of these days you're gonna look over your shoulder and there's gonna be nobody there. The other definition I like is leaders add value to the frontline workers where the actual work is being done. Now, when you do innovation in organizations, the person that writes the check and has the authority and the people down here who have the bright ideas, these are the product champions and the workers, and this person's the authorizing sponsor. All these people in between are called reinforcing sponsors. And unless they're well-educated and you, and you don't have many of these things, these people tend to kill off these innovations because if these people are successful, these politicians fear they're gonna be replaced. So you've got a sort of a dampening effect in large organizations for innovation. <clears throat> the other reason this doesn't work is something called the Victor Verum decision model. It's to simplify it because I can keep this around in my head. You're, let's, I want you to imagine that you're a leader and you have a decision to make. How do you, what process, what type of, how do you make the decision? Well, you can make the decision yourself. That's an autocratic decision. You can talk to a few key people, make a consultative decision. 
you can actually get a whole group, your whole group together and make a group decision if you have the right skills to do that. There's group decision process skills that you need to know. Or you can not even make the decision at all. You can set up some, make, delegate, totally delegate the decision. So you've got four things you can do as a leader. Got it? There are three factors that you need to take into effect as to which one of those you pick. The first is how much time there is. If there's no time, you don't call committee meetings, okay? You've got to do something right there. That's obviously an autocratic decision. But the second piece of information is how accurate is the information you have that relates to the decision that has to be made. And what people, as they go up organizations, have to realize they is know less and less about what's going on down here. So if you don't have accurate information, you better talk to some people or get some people together to make the decision or you're going to make the wrong decision. But you may have the right, right information and you may have all the time you need, but the third factor is how much buy-in do you want at the front line? If you need buy-in for your decisions, you better involve them in the decision process. Because if you don't, it isn't going to work. And I see the violation of the room decision model all the time, <laughs> working with organizations. Now, this really doesn't work when you're dealing with knowledge workers. I mean, it doesn't work when you're dealing with frontline assembly workers. But when you're dealing with knowledge workers like physicians, nurses, educators, accountants, engineers, professionals of any type, it really doesn't work. So the next iteration was total quality management. This was uh, popularized by W. Edwards Deming. Uh, Dr. Deming was a stat statistician, a professor, uh, of mathematics and he's a trained engineer and he was actually working a little part-time with the Census Bureau because in the early part of the 20th century the census went from counting everybody to sampling. So they needed statistical knowledge to do that so they hired Dr. Deming. And at the end of World War II the Army actually hired Dr. Deming to go over and count Japanese because they were occupying Japan. Well he did something while he was there. He actually trained all the leaders of the emerging Japanese industries on total quality management which is statistical process control that eliminates waste, that gives you higher quality and lower cost, but the trick is that it is frontline involvement and involves teams at the front line to make the decisions and to solve the problems. This is why when I was growing up in the early 50s, if somebody said made in Japan, it meant junk, and about 20 years later, it didn't mean junk anymore, and the American companies were going over to Japan to try and figure out what they were doing, but the person who led the charge was actually living about quarter of a mile outside the District of Columbia border in Chevy Chase, Maryland, Dr. Deming. So just to look at this sort of graphically, um, true quality means using statistical quality tools to improve processes. Individual effort does not overcome poorly designed systems and processes. I, I encounter lots of professionals. I did this when I was working at, toward the end of Kaiser. You work as hard as you can but the work just keeps coming down, the policies, the new procedures just keep coming down, nobody's funding it. A management is doing nice things for you, like they're giving you a laptop so you can then work at home for nothing, you know? Probably been in organizations like that. Uh, but the other thing about quality is, uh, we're constantly looking for outliers. Uh, there was a famous case where a surgeon actually took off the wrong leg in Florida a number of years ago. You may have heard about that and read about it. Uh, the interesting thing about that, of course, he was penalized. They found, they found the person who was at fault, right? But when you analyze that from a process and a quality improvement standpoint, there were 38 errors that were made by a variety of people that led up to that happening. And what you need to know that wasn't known in the press is both of this gentleman's, this elderly gentleman's diabetic legs were so bad that the one that was taken off by mistake was probably gonna have to come off in two months anyway. Now that doesn't excuse the fact that it was wrong site surgery. But as a, as, as, as a consequence of that, well, every surgeon in this country does a 30-second timeout and goes through a checklist to make sure they don't cut off the wrong limb. The crazy thing, and you're going to see this in a, in a, in a little bit when, you, when we get to the next iteration of quality, is that wrong site surgery is such a rare event that those 30-second timeouts that are taken across the entire company, country are not making a difference in the incidence of that. It's still occurring. So we're wasting all that time and energy to do something that is very rare. And we're not focusing on the common things like heart disease and things like that. So in quality management, we don't just look for the problem people. The question is, if it's acceptable to be this good over here, why, if you can be this good, why is it acceptable to be this good? So quality management is about moving the quality curve in a quality direction and narrowing the variability down so people are doing things a little bit more. Brent James, who uh, 
is one of the true leaders in this country of healthcare improvement, is at the Institute of Healthcare Improvement, where I'm a graduate of the Advanced Training Program. He famously says, given the choice as a professional to do the right thing or the same thing, never do the right thing. And what he means is if there are five professionals and we're doing all things differently, there's so much variability in the system you can't improve it. But if you can get everybody working on a, a well scientific evidence-based protocol, they do all the same things, then you can see how they're doing, as you'll see in a minute, and change something and it may get better, it might get worse. But you can actually do quality improvement. So this is one of those sayings that sort of doesn't make sense until you sort of understand the context. So to show you how that works, in dealing with stable systems which are consistent, predictable, and when you introduce gradual change, when you measure single outcomes, car manufacturing, medical errors, and human metabolism, this is an example of a run chart where you're monitoring a result of something over time. And this is a stable system. These are the control arms, uh, statistical process control arms. So this thing's just cooking along. So this is a stable system. It may go up, it may go down. If you, one of the tools, uh, one of the gentlemen, Dr. Staker, who is an internist at Intermountain, for his project in the 90s, he actually had a population of diabetic patients do one thing. Instead of recording their fasting blood sugars in little booklets and coming in with their doctors with this sort of booklet of information, he had them put their morning fasting sugars on a run chart every morning. That was the only intervention he did. And just that intervention alone, so the patients could see the feedback and it was presented, the graphic information was presented in, a, in an understandable fashion, they dropped their hemoglobin A1C control by half a point, just with no change in medication or diet. That was the only intervention. And because when patients will forget their medicine, they will see that it goes up and then they get the feedback. Or if they go away for a weekend and they break from the McDougal diet, they see that their sugars get worse, you see? So, but this only works in stable systems, and there are a lot of stable systems around that we can improve, and medicine can certainly do that, and you'll see examples of that in a minute. So, Intermountain Healthcare, which started on this journey in 1985, deep post-operative infection rates, this is when you go to a person and uh, you have elective surgery for abdominal surgery, and you may or may not get a deep infection from that. And the Joint Commission standard is about two to four percent, so if you're a hospital and you have that infection rate, you're given a gold star. Intermountain Healthcare in 1985 was 1.8, so most hospitals would have stopped at that point. But Intermountain said, we don't want to be good compared to other people. We want to be the best we can be. So they over a six-year journey, they were able to decrease their post-op infection rate to 0.4%. That saved $30,000 in a 300-bed hospital. An example of better cost, better care, lower cost, better service. They then tackled adverse drug reactions, which you heard Dr. Greger talk about. In the old days when we did discharge summaries, we'd write on the bottom, we'd sign our discharge summary, and we'd have to check a box whether there had been an adverse drug reaction or not on that patient for that hospitalization. And given that information, they thought they had a 0.025% rate. But they knew, their, they knew intuitively that they had more reactions than that, so they hired a bunch of nurses to actually review the hospital chart. And they found they actually had 10 times as many infections, a quarter of a percent. But then they set up a more sophisticated system of a, of, that involved a computer and actually tracking people after discharge, and they found they actually had a 2% adverse drug reaction rate. So now they knew what their problem was. They looked at cause and effect, and they came up with the five leading causes of adverse drug reactions in their populations, and that's two-thirds of the reactions, and they instituted a computer program that automatically, when you went into the hospital and entered your age, your weight, your creatinine, which is a measure of your kidney function, and the classes of drugs you were allergic to, and any time an order was written for a drug, it automatically cross-checked, and if it was out of line, a flag went up, the doctor was called with a recommendation to change the order. And what they did was they eliminated two-thirds of their adverse drug reactions in that 300-bed hospital and saved $3 million a year. Better care, lower cost, better service. The new dimension we need to talk about is complexity because we have a lot of stable systems we can improve, but it's a complex world. And it involves adaptive systems, which are a set of things, people, cells, molecules, or whatever, that are interconnected in such a way as they produce their own pattern of behavior over time. So what this means when you innovate in complex systems, like in human beings, which are complex systems, or medical teams, clinical teams, or organizations, you can do the same thing at one point in time and get an absolutely different result at another. So let's say you're doing a cloning experiment, okay? 
and you think you're going to get the same results. <laughs> but uh, in point of fact, an intervention at a given time comes up with something different. It's non-predictable. It's complex. The nice thing about working in complex systems, if you move upstream and do the right thing, you can get really dramatic results downstream. So to give you an example, let's say you build a building that is so efficient that you don't need to put in a heater air conditioning system. You don't need to pay for its installation. You don't have to pay for the bills. And you actually don't have to pay for the repair. That's going upstream. We'll get to human beings in a little bit. But you also have a problem when you do adapt a system that you get unpredicted outcomes, unanticipated outcomes. So you might put in an open access system, for instance, like we did at Kaiser, to make sure everybody gets in, because people want to get in. They want access, right? But if you don't measure the consequences to quality of care, staff satisfaction, and other areas, you might actually look very good with access, but actually be doing harm in other areas. So when you start adapting, when you start doing innovation in complex systems, you've got to be a little careful, and you've got to measure outcomes along the way. A good example of this is Operation Cat Drop. Uh, illustration here courtesy of Alison Carmichael, who's actually an author, who, an author and an artist who lives in Carcassonne, France. Never been there, been close to it, would love to go back and see it. Beautiful town. Uh, but in the early 50s, they were having an outbreak of malaria in Borneo. So the World Health Organization funded a, a, a large program to spray DDT to kill the mosquitoes. And they did kill the mosquitoes, and the malaria went down. But then unanticipated consequences started to occur. They were killing a parasitic wasp. The parasitic wasp actually kept the thatch-eating caterpillars in check. So without the parasitic wasp, there were lots of thatch-eating caterpillars, which if you have roofs that are thatch roofs is a problem because they then start collapsing. So then the government funded, put, gave them metal roofs. Now, you can imagine what sleeping under a metal roof in, the, in Borneo is like when it's raining, probably like trying to sleep inside of a drum, okay? So the people weren't doing well, they, but they got new roofs out of it, okay? They weren't thatched roofs. But meanwhile, the insects that were dying were being eaten by the geckos, and the geckos were being eaten by the cats. The cats were dying. And of course, without the cats, what happened to the rats? Lots of rats. So then they had an episode. They were worried that they might have a sylvonic plague or typhus outbreak. So to solve the problems of having no cats and to get rid of the rats, uh, the Air Force parachuted in 14,000 cats. Operation Cat Drop. Another thing you need to be aware of, and I use this clinically, is how you get change in adaptive in, in, in dealing with humans or other adaptive. There are different levers of change. And we use these things with our patients all the time. We share articles, we tell stories, we use our relationship, we give feedback as far as uh, information and lab tests, we find out what your goals are, and we try and change some of your belief systems. And they're all more or less effective. For instance, uh, Bill Clinton, when he had his first cardiac procedure, he had that cardiac procedure done at the hospital in New York State that had the highest morbidity and mortality for that procedure. <laughs> now, I, know, I don't think Bill knew that when he went in. I don't think President Clinton knew that when he went in. Uh, his cardiologist might not have known. I'm sure his cardiovascular surgeon knew because this data was published in public at the time. But cardiovascular surgeon probably didn't have data on his own outcomes and didn't know how he compared. He probably just assumed that, well, that was the other guys that were having the bad outcomes, you know. Uh, to give you an idea how this changes behavior in a patient, let's say you have a belief that milk does the body good. So you walk into the store and you're going, I'm going to pick up some milk, walk out feeling pretty good. And then you get some new information and you find, well, maybe it doesn't do body good, but it still tastes good. So I'm going to pick some milk up. Maybe you don't buy as much of it, but you're still buying it. And then you find, well, milk does the body harm. Maybe you know that it contains IGF-1, which is a promoter and associated with cancer, or the casein, the main protein in dairy, dairy milk, initiates and promotes the growth of cancer cells. Maybe you don't believe the science, but all of a sudden milk, you believe that milk maybe, maybe does your harm. Maybe you buy a little less milk. And then you find out that casein, which is the main protein in milk, is, breaking, is broke down into eight different casomorphins in your gut, and they're absorbed. It's actually an addictive substance. And at the cheese manufacturers of the world, have you broken up into market segments? Not the people in this room, but people who are cheese cravers. They eat cheese straight out of the package every day. That's 20% of the market. Or 20% of the market are cheese enhancers. They put cheese on everything. This isn't weak will, folks. This is biochemical addiction. So now you're going into the store. Maybe it does harm, and maybe it's addicting. 
You still may be buying a yogurt here or there because you know, you're not really sure about all this stuff. Maybe you think you can get away with a little bit. And then you find out the next piece of information, which is milk and dairy products contain dioxin, which is the most carcinogenic substance known to man. And the FDA recommended safe level is 129 femtograms a day. That is a quadrillionth of a gram. And you find out that a scoop of a high quality ice cream has 49,000 femtograms. Or that a single pizza of, from a popular uh, pizza, I don't want to name any names, a single piece of pizza has 95,000 femtograms. And you find out that the half-life of this stuff in the human body is six to seven years. So instead of milk does the body good, milk is a harmful, addictive, poisonous substance. And I can go through other chemicals that are in milk besides the dioxin, but I just wanted to use one. So if, when, I, when I talk to patients, I try and change your belief systems. And when you change your belief systems, that's one of the most powerful levers. So the last iteration in quality is Lean and Six Sigma, where you have high variety in small batches. Speed and waste reduction is called Lean. Parts per million defects are called Six Sigma. In this situation, it's not just teams of people on the front line that are improving quality. Everybody is improving quality. Got it? So how does healthcare figure, given this level of uh, quality? Well, first, I've got to take you back to grade school. Most of you went to school. Most of you got report cards. A, B, C, D, F. You've been, so if you look at the next slide and look up in the right-hand corner, I can't, sigma basically stands for standard deviation. That's not totally accurate, but, just, but I don't want to get into the statistics of it. But if you had seven defects out of 100 on your test, 93%, you were usually graded as an A. If you had maybe 31 defects out of 100, you were two sigma, you failed at one sigma. Generally, healthcare is about a B. It's somewhere between mountain climbing and bungee jumping, okay? Now, you would never fly on an airline where seven planes crashed out of 100. So scheduled airlines are, are called ultra safe. They've worked things out, although they've, that was a journey that they started in the 70s and they've gotten a lot better. And in, in, in actually in medicine, we do have a star hitter and it's anesthesiology, it's 5.2. In this country, if you get put to sleep, you're probably gonna get woken up, okay? And, and I think the reason they got into this game better than anybody else did, I know Michael Clapper here is one of my colleagues, did some anesthesia, he can tell you about the old days where they'd have different machines and the green knobs for oxygen, if you turn, the right, turn it right, the oxygen went up, but on other models, you turned it right, the oxygen went down. <laughs> so, you know, they, they standardized their equipment, they had protocol, they came up with, so they actually fixed things because they got, they were in, they got feedback loops. I mean, they put people to sleep, they went into the recovery room and if they didn't wake up, things were bad, you know? Or if people woke up and they couldn't speak or they couldn't move side of their body or there was a complication, they knew about it real quick and this was bad stuff. So they've actually led the charge, and it would be nice if the rest of healthcare followed. So that's where healthcare is as far as hazards. So let's get into the, to the RXs as we were. Let's talk about the government for a second. I'm a fan of the Oregon Health Plan. This is something that has an incredible amount of potential. Uh, this is Governor John Kitzhaber. He's actually governor for the second term in Oregon now, but he was actually an emergency room physician. And he was elected to the Oregon Senate, and he became leader of the Senate, and at that time, their system for uh, funding health care, like Medi-Cal in California, was a mess. So they figured, look, this is very simple. We're treating a lot of diagnoses. We don't have enough money to do everything. We really need some sort of prioritization system to figure out what we're going to spend our money on. We want to spend our money on things that help, not hurt. So they went around to businesses, people, medicine doctors, and they listed the, in priority order, from number one to like 785, from top to bottom, what the, what the most effective to the least effective thing, and they say, okay, now we've got the, the order, how much money do we have, how many people are we gonna have to cover, we can fund down to 415. We will pay for all those diagnoses. If it below 415, we're not gonna pay for it. You can still get it if you wanna go out and pay for it out of your own pocket. That's a very elegant system. And it's so elegant that actually, if medicine was a lot more efficient and did its job well, we could probably, for the same amount of money, drop those diagnoses way down to the bottom if we, in fact, wanted to treat some of those things. But the order is critical. Uh, I know there are two doctors in the audience uh, who are, are physicians in Oregon, and they may be able to influence this when they go back home. But last time I checked, the number eight thing on the list was gastric bypass surgery, which I think should be maybe not even on the list, but uh, at least it should be down below 700 or something. 
compared to other things on the list. So the take home message is don't pay for things that are effective. But this is an elegant system and I think it's a major step in the right direction. And we could have based some of the stuff that was, that was done by the US Senate. And actually he's talking about this to other governors now. Uh, we'll see if they innovate and follow, his, follow the lead. So let's talk about non-medical organizations. Whole Foods, Geico, Bank of America, they're all drowning in health care costs. Post office is having trouble because they're having to fund their retirement costs. This is a good personal friend of mine, Tom Elkin. He was actually my co-coach in the under-8 soccer team when his son and my oldest son played together. I have a National C coaching license in soccer. I did that pretty seriously for about 11 years. Uh, but when I was coaching uh, my son and his son, David, uh, when they were under 16, he was telling me about some of this stuff. And this is incredible work. But I'll, as it relates today, Tom worked for Medi-Cal and then he came in as uh, the health benefits and services for CalPERS, which basically provides the benefits for uh, state workers and retired workers. And at that particular point when he came in, they, 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 you had the option as a worker to take up to 22 different people. You could take, there are 22 health plans you could choose. Uh, they were all different. They determined their rates. There was no data on how all these people were performing. And Tom thought this was a little nuts, so he got some people together over a year and they came up with a standard benefit package. Now remember what I said about Brent James? Whenever you're given, do, everybody, here all these health providers were doing what they considered was the right thing. Tom said let's start doing the same thing. So then he had them bidding on the same package. And then they started doing a little tough negotiations, uh, held over them the fear of enrollment freeze, and they started requiring them to give data. F over a three year period, their increase went from 18% to 0%. Based on, that saved $521 million over a three year period. Now you gotta be careful. Remember the top down Taylor organizations? That, that is pretty typical of most medical organizations. If you, if you all of a sudden take money from organizations like that, what do they do? Management cuts the budget, right? They do across the board cuts. Some of you may have experienced those sort of things in your life, in your organizations. A consulting firm named Murphy did a study in New York that showed that health systems that cut 4% across the board, hospital systems that cut 4% across the board, morbidity and mortality goes up 200%. If they cut across the board 8%, morbidity and mortality goes up 400%. So this is a success story, but there's a little bit of a, uh, you gotta be cautious when you do this. But what they found was they, the shared data actually, the, their performance data and the providers actually went up. So they were paying, it was better care, lower costs, better service. Geico uh, Insurance, uh, PCRM, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, did an outpatient intervention with Geico. This is published data. It was a 22-week intervention. It was one hour a week. They basically did a low-fat plant-based diet, some cooking classes. They actually had to fix the cafeteria so these people, once they were going through the class, could actually buy McDougal-type food in the cafeteria. This is Hillary and Bruce at the beginning of it. This is Hillary and Bruce after nine to 12 months after they completed their first half marathon ever. Yes. Um, and Hillary had actually lost 85 pounds and Bruce had lost almost 95, wow. almost 100. Now I don't know what their cholesterol numbers are, but their blood pressure numbers or their glucose numbers or other, th other things, but I can guarantee if you tracked all their measures in this adaptation, you would find a lot of success there. The star, however, goes to Whole Foods. And Whole Foods is doing remarkable things. And I'm blessed uh, that John lets me I have the honor and the privilege to come down and see Whole Food team members here twice a year. Uh, and this slide and the information I have here is extracted from a slide John Mackey presented here last year. And he was kind enough to share his slides with me. And even though he wouldn't give me the absolute numbers, I was actually able to back off the uh, information I'm presenting based on those slides. So Whole Foods was pretty typical. They were getting 15, 20% increases uh, up until 2006. And they instituted one innovation, it's a health savings account. They have pretty high copay. In other words, they have sort of, people have to pay up to a certain amount, and then once you get up to a certain amount, they cover everything. But if you don't use your health care, you get to carry over some of those savings every year. So there's a, they added an incentive for people to be a little bit more discretionary in their use of the medical system. And as you can see, things started to get better. But then in 2008, they started talking, and in 2009, they implemented two programs. The first is the biometric testing program. If you're a Whole Foods employee, you can, as a voluntary program, pay $50, get glucose, 
fasting sugars, your height and weight measured, your blood pressure measured, and your urine checked for coat, for, to make sure you're not a smoker. And based on the results of those parameters, your worst numbers, if you're a Whole Foods employee, you get 20% off in the store. But you can bump yourself up to 30% if you go from bronze to, to, to silver to gold, and actually platinum's over here, which is the 10%. So there is an incentive for them, and actually they, they are actually investing in their employees to be healthier. The other thing they did is they had heard about the McDougal program and the great results that John had had with Blue Cross and Blue Shield up in Minnesota and talked to John. John, I believe, is on their advisory committee. So they, they came up with an immersion program similar to the McDougal program, but it's an eight-day program, not a 10-day. I think it was skinny down for two reasons. The first reason was probably the most important. They, Mackey wanted their uh, team members to be able to do this on a week's vacation so they could fly out on a weekend, take a week off, fly home on a weekend. So it worked well with their schedules. I actually think uh, John could have to tell me this later, but I think Mackey actually were able to talk him down a little bit in price and get a little cheaper program because it was eight days and not 10 days. But, uh, but modeling over the immersion programs, you can see what happened after 2009. They got no increases in, in 2010 and the medical costs went down over 10% in 2011. They saved between 10 and 20 million dollars. I don't know of any other organization in the country that's doing that. Remarkable data. It's going to be a little, yeah, great, flawed Whole Foods. It's going to be a little embarrassing to me in the medical industry if grocery stores and markets are leading the way in improving the health care. <laughs> but hey, as Michael Clapper and Dr. McDougall say, we'll take all the help we can get from wherever we can get it, you know? <laughs> so let's talk about medical organizations. My diagnosis for them is focusing on chronic disease, because that's where the money is. You have to change the belief system of the medical system from controlling disease to reversing it to preventing it. And it's another cartoon courtesy of Hans Diehl, mopping up here, nobody's fixing the leaks, poor patients over here in the corner with a little umbrella trying to protect themselves. <laughs> And, and I think, and I just had a paper accepted for publication in the Physician Executive Journal, focusing on the best science, proper finance and investment, the proper way to innovate, and following the right path is the way out of this for medical organizations. So let's talk about the best science, because I'm going to put my physician hat on here for a minute. I'd like you to get something out of here that you can actually take home and improve your health. Uh, diabetes. We've, thought, we've known for a while that it's the fat in the diet that downregulates the genes that run the mitochondria in the cells that burn the sugars. And we've known for a longer time, but at least it was reaffirmed in 2004, that fat in the diet interferes with the insulin, which is the hormone that grabs a hold of the glucose and throws it in the cells so the mitochondria can burn it. So diabetes may be a sugar processing problem, but it's caused by fats. That's a belief system. Most doctors don't know that. They're having to count carbs. They're doing the American Diabetic Association diet. Uh, research done by Dr. Barnard, 22-week uh, and a 74-week study showed that a low-fat plant-based diet was much more effective than the American Diabetic Association diet at control of diabetes <laughs> and getting people off medications. It's a sugar processing problem. But one of my pet peeves, and the only, John wrote a great book called The Start Solution. And the only thing I would have changed about the book is I would have put a little bit more information in about what sugar is because people use the term and you've got to be specific and the devil's always in the details. You know sugar is table sugar, but table sugar is actually two molecules. It's glucose and fructose. Now these are two little ringed molecules that are very similar in the body, but the body treats them very differently. Glucose is burned by all cells. It suppresses the appetite. It's sweet and it's stored in the muscle and liver as glycogen, which is just strings of like complex carbohydrates, and also fat if you eat too much. So that's your primary, f that's your fuel, that's your gasoline, that's what you need. Fructose is handled entirely differently by the body. It's burned primarily by the liver. 98% is burned by the liver. Your body almost treats it like it doesn't know what to do with it. It doesn't suppress appetite and it's a lot sweeter. So you can see, here's a, here's a, here's a substance that doesn't suppress your appetite but is very sweet. If it's any surprise that you find a lot of this stuff in processed foods. It's like a food processor's dream, you know, something that doesn't suppress your appetite and it's really sweet. It's not stored. It also doesn't affect your glucose level at all. 
So it's low glycemic. But the problem is what the liver does with it. It makes it into uric acid, which predisposes you to gout. Also messes up the nitrous oxide system and raises your blood pressure. It's manufactured into cholesterol, triglycerides, aldehydes, which are inflammatory compounds that contribute to cirrhosis of the liver and uh, does do a couple good things in the liver. I'll give you an example. I had a patient at the, at the Whole Food, McDougal Whole Foods program in October. Usually when I see patients here, we do the exam, we get their lab work, we get out of the picture, we let John and his remarkable staff do their magic for you know, eight, seven days, and then you get to see them again and you get all these numbers and they look great. Here's a guy who came in with triglycerides of 200, he had triglycerides of 500. I said, what have you been eating? He says, I love fruit. There's baskets of fruit all over this place. I've been eating nothing but fruit. So I had to give him a new recommendation on his fruit intake and have him recheck his cholesterol down the line. So with fruit, you have to, yeah, fructose, you have to have caution. So fruits contain table sugar, glucose, and fructose, but they also contain some good things like fiber and phytochemicals. So you've got to be specific about what you mean by sugar. And it was interesting in Rosen's talk last night to talk about sugar affecting the junctions between the endothelial cells. I found that to be fascinating. But my guess, I'm going to have to look at the literature, but my guess is probably the fructose and not the glucose that's doing it. So complex carbohydrates are good. And the reason is they're just long chains of glucose molecules. And if anybody ever asks you why you're eating like that, you can tell them that you are a hindgut fermenting herbivore. Because you're going to be wearing your starchivore shirt, and they're going to say, what's a starchivore? And you're going to say, well, that's a shortcut of saying we're hindgut fermenting herbivores. <laughs> animals, animals, that are, animals that are designed to eat plants need to, di need to have some adaptation for their intestines. Cats have very short intestines. They're pure carnivores. You've got to either have an adaption in your foregut, like cows, they have multiple stomachs, right? Or you've got to have an adaption in your hindgut, like elephants, horses, and humans. Because You've got to get the stuff out of the, out of the, out of the food. Now, because fiber is hard to digest. As a matter of fact, you don't digest it, as Dr. Greger was talking about. It's a little bacteria, a little friendly bacteria. You've got to love Dr. Greger and the way he presents, right? <laughs> a little bacteria that break, break your fiber up. So actually, it sits in your intestine. When I was in medical school, we don't want to talk about how long ago that was. We fortunately learned some stuff since then. I just thought, we were taught that the colon just held on to your feces and was absorbing water. But we now know, as Dr. Greger said, that those bacteria break your fiber up into two, three, and four carbon molecules that are absorbed in the body. He talked about the three carbon molecule that actually helps your cholesterol. The four carbon molecule lowers your glucose. The two carbon molecule you've heard about because it's called carbohydrate loading. Those acetates are burned as energy by your muscles. So the reason we're set up like this, and we've, we have an adaptation from the great apes. Uh, this is uh, Nathaniel Dominey's work who presented here <laughs> about a year ago, I think, maybe a year and a half ago, uh, he showed that we have two to three times the amylase genes that the great apes do. And basically, amylase is the genes in your saliva and put out by your pancreas into your intestine that breaks apart these long chains of glucose molecules. So we are adapted to digest starches. We also, uh, Catherine Milton, who's a professor at Berkeley, was here and presented last year as well. And uh, she showed that humans have a 40% increase in the volume of their small intestines. So that's where you absorb your glucose. So we have adapted to be starchivores. We're hindgut fermenters. And this is why we can move away from the equator, because we can deal with uh, starches and tubers and grains and things like that, whereas our great ape relatives are stuck around the equator where they have to live, where everything's in season all year round. So tell them you're a hindgut fermenting herbivore. So let's talk about finance briefly. Uh, first day of medical school. Preventive medicine kills return business. Now this isn't necessarily bad if you are a prepaid healthcare system because you get all your money up front. And the less you do, the more money you make. So there's, this is actually the best system for, for people who would, if you want to do a lot of primary or secondary prevention, you make a lot of money in systems like this. So from my perspective, any prepaid healthcare organization in the country that isn't pursuing what we're talking about here is missing huge opportunities and, 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 and a lot of patients are suffering because of it. However, that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is fee for service. But then again, why change your diet when you can just keep sending me to the Bahamas twice a year? <laughs> you gotta love Dan Pereira and Bizarro cartoons, right? Dan gives me permission to use his cartoons and I really appreciate that. 
Uh, but in fee for services, you can see you don't start making any profit at all until you go above your total cost line. So the more you do, the more you make. Now, there are a lot of systems out there that are combinations of these two, but you've sort of got the picture in your mind. Uh, so let's, if you're in a medical organization, you can bring programs in. So this is, I want to do two examples here. Ottawa Ankle Rules. This is out of the, published out of the uh, ER in uh, Ottawa, Canada. They used Bayesian theorems, and they looked at history of people who had sprained their ankles, which is a common complaint that comes into emergency rooms, and physical diagnosis that the doctors could do. And they identified one history and four physical diagnostic things that if they were done and they were all negative, you didn't get any, you get x-rays. So this resulted in 30% fewer ankle films, foot films, half the cost, fewer time in the OR. Physicians liked it. They didn't miss any significant fractures. Better care, lower cost better service, right? At the other extreme is the story of a Swedish dialysis center. There was a Saab mechanic who was about 25 or 26, and he had lost his kidney function from a disease called Bright's disease when he was about six or seven. So he was on dialysis. But he was in the auto industry, and he knew a lot about quality improvement. So he was watching these people do the dialysis, and he was seeing them making all these errors and stuff like that. And he wasn't feeling too good after the dialysis, so he thought he could do it better than they could. So he got a nurse to teach him to do it. And it worked out so well, they started teaching other people to do it. And pretty soon they had so many people do it, they said, you know, we're, we don't want scheduled appointments coming into this big dialysis center. So they funded and built a patient design center that is always open. They put exercise equipment, computer equipment in it. They have card passes to get in. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It is cheaper, it is better, it is better care at lower cost and better service, okay? They think 80% of their patients can be trained to do their own dialysis. That's a better system. Mammography. Courtesy of John's May newsletter, when I read the Cochrane Collaborative Recommendations in a pamphlet called, an 18-page booklet called Screening for Breast Cancer with Mammography, which I highly recommend every woman in the room over age 30 read. I can no longer recommend mammography for women at any age. Wow. And I'm talking about a general screening recommendation for populations, not diagnosis. There's still a place for mammography if a woman feels a lump or a physician feels a lump. But as a come in every two years to get your mammography, it doesn't work. Peter Gotze, one of the lead authors of this, wrote a book, 385-page book, which is a very instructional book because it goes through every statistical study and tells you the pros and cons. I would recommend it being read by every physician because it's very, very educational. Uh, and if they don't have the statistical skills to understand that, there are YouTube videos by Dr. Wel Welsh, who was here, presented at the McDougal weekend. He was nice enough to let John put his two uh, videos up on YouTube. I would, I would have people recommend doing that. But the bottom line is you take 2,000 women, you screen them for 10 years, you save one woman, 10 women are treated that don't need to be treated. So you're creating harm in five or six of those. You're increasing their morbidity and mortality quite a bit. And here again, it's a 10%, so you get 200 biopsies. What we need is shared decision models. This is, there's a whole literature on this, and there are companies that do this, but Kaiser did a little work early in the Colorado, uh, their Colorado region. Uh, basically, it'll take about a 20 or 30 minute video to present all this data to a patient like a woman so she can make an adequate informed decision and be allowed to put in her values and stuff like that. It takes 20 or 30 minutes. So this whole idea that your doctor can give you good informed consent about some of this stuff in the limited time they have uh, is just, is, it's a crazy system of care. Uh, the one thing that Dr. Gosselin did mention is uh, of these 10 over treatments, uh, there are incidental cancers which actually you cure yourself. And the study looks like that about one-third of the cancers that women get between the age of 40 and 50, they actually cure themselves. But they're found by mammography, so they're treated. The crazy thing about this, you remember we talked about feedback loops? Let's say you've got 11 women running around who've been treated for cancer. And they're all saved. And they're all out there telling, mammography saved my life. Ten are actually wrong. Actually wrong. So this sort of feeds into this disease mongering system, just sort of spirals out of control. We did uh, a project at uh, 
of Innovation at the Ranch Cordova, where I was physician in charge. Very innovative program. We brought all sorts of innovations into a two-physician eye clinic. At this time, this was in the early 90s when Kaiser Permanente was trying to control their costs. They wanted to know what the optimal eye clinic was, because eye clinics are hard to build. They have those long rooms with expensive machines. And we had two ophthalmologists, so we did the pilot. We basically did on a $125,000 investment, we saved $1.25 million annually. The physicians got to do more surgeries. They were seeing more patients, but they were happier. There were no waits for consults. It was better care at lower cost and better service if staff even got a 5% raise. And they had the best service scores in the region. I wrote, when my first article was published, I wrote about some of the things they did, but uh, we don't have time to go into it. But, but the few studies that have been done on waste in healthcare, like at Intermountain Healthcare where they followed the nurses around their hospitals, they estimated that 50 to 70 percent of what the nurses did was waste of time. And, and, and it's amazing how much we impose on our healthcare professionals, and that's the most valuable asset in the organization. It happens all the time. Intermountain Healthcare has now got 80 percent of their clinical activities in over 165 activities. One recent elective induction protocol where ladies came in in labor and they were going to have elective inductions. They're saving $50 million a year and they dropped their, uh, of their deliveries 26 percent to 3 percent are now uh, elective inductions. Here again, better care, lower cost, better service, better clinical outcomes, staff satisfaction. So what they've built at IHC is they avoid this top-down control and command sort of thing. They uh, use solid processes around data. They base everything they do on professional values and focus on patient needs, and they have a shared culture of quality. If you're a physician and you go to work for Intermountain, in your first two years, you have to have two days of training on statistical process control and quality improvement. They give it to you for nothing, but it's a requirement that you do that. So they start from day one. They just don't do an orientation day or something like that. They build skills in their clinicians. I think Intermountain is well positioned. If, if they ever incorporate primary and secondary prevention into their systems, because a lot of times they do these processes, they don't go far enough upstream and do things consistent with the best design, they're going to they're they're really do some impressive work. So what's the path forward? We have to have, know where we are. We have to know what we want to do. We have to avoid our villains. It's going to require a new structure and a business model. But it will be a rewarding journey, but it will be difficult. So let's get back to our numbers, right? Remember Michael Greger said we were number six, right? And I said we're number three. I'm an engineer. And you know, the CT scan, I was in NIH working there as a chemical engineer when the first CT scan was demonstrated in the United States. And for those of you that sort of don't know about the mathematics of CT scans, they shoot x-rays through your brain and they catch it in a, and then they solve the equations so they solve the density of these little cubes in your brain. The problem with that matrix of equations is it's a non-solvable mathematical equation. So some engineers in England made an assumption that allowed them to solve the equations, and it worked so well they went right from plastics and metals to human studies. So assumptions are what engineers do. They don't always work out, but sometimes you've got to do that stuff. So that's just people I talk to like John and Dr. Esselstyn and Let's assume that cardiovascular disease, 90% is preventable, 50% of cancers, 50% strokes, and 30% of diabetes is preventable. Let's hold the medical industry accountable for that, okay? But let's, maybe the numbers aren't right, so let's just hold them accountable for 50% of that. And then you move those numbers into their column, okay? We're the leading cause of death in the country. Now, this should be a wake-up call. And if you wake up, you've got to ask yourself, where are you going to start? Well, I'd recommend starting with diabetes for a couple reasons. You get quick feedback. And this is Kaiser Permanente's data. And this is very similar to other medical organizations. And it just keeps going up and up and up. Uh, this is freely available on the web. You can find out this information. It's public information. I would set a goal of 0% type 2 diabetics in your population. That reframes the whole way of thinking. You put them on low-fat, plant-based diet, you focus on clinical teams, and you get them working as teams using good quality improvement tools. You develop support systems around them, clinical, financial, and patients. You find out what the patients need to make the transition. You start making it better and better and better, and you track measures across all areas. So you not only do you report on your success with diabetes, you report on your success for blood pressure, you report on your success with cholesterol, you track your financial benefits, and you just 
get the snowball rolling. You start small and just build on it. Let's digress for a minute. Let's talk, we, uh, you've got to address, uh, we've got to overcome our healthcare villains, okay? And understand villains a little bit. This is da Dana Meadows, a very famous environmental scientist, Dartmouth professor, unfortunately died at the age of 60 in 2001 from meningitis. Uh, she did a model of the Northeast Atlantic codfish system, very simple mathematical model. And she demonstrated, and this was the largest fishery ever known to mankind. It was incredible fishery. There's, the Basque fishermen were fishing off the banks of Canada a thousand years before Leif Erikson. It was an amazing system. And the profits of the fishing companies were greatest right before the entire ecosystem collapsed. It's illegal to fish for cod in Canada right now. They're waiting for the ecosystem to come back. Actually, there's two boats that go out. They can each catch 100 fish, but they're just monitoring the system to see if it's going to come back. She showed that the desire to grow the fishing industries didn't save the fish. She showed the technology didn't save the fish. 80-mile drag nets, freezers on the ships, radar to locate the fish. That didn't save the fish. And the market didn't save the fish. Everybody says, well, the market. We need competition. We need the market. The market would have saved the fish if everybody in the world made the same amount of money. But the very wealthy will pay a lot of money for the last fish. Remember the blue fin tuna story that, that Richard put up in his presentation? So the market, she says, okay, now that I've sort of taken on the conservatives, I'm going to move to the other side of the aisle. While all this was going on, the governments of the world were, were, were subsidizing that fishing industry $6.2 billion. So government's not the answer. So the answer is local control and balanced feedback loops and knowing where to intervene. The list of levers came from her. And the other thing you need to know is not everything that is in not everything that is important can be measured. A great introductory book for this is Thinking in Systems, a primer in 2008, if you're interested in reading a little bit more about complex systems. So what are our healthcare villains? We focus on growth, not efficiency, and turn, such as turnover and waste. We apply technology without proper evaluation and diffusion. We believe that market and government are going to continue paying these exorbitant costs. So we need a new business model and a new structure in healthcare organizations. We need to move from conventional capitalism to natural capitalism. I also recommend a book called Natural Capitalism by Paul Hawkins and the two Lovins. Uh, the difference between price and true cost. Price is what the market sets in a conventional capitalistic system. The true cost is what it costs society. So the Institute for Transportation did a study in 2001 that showed that the cost of gasoline, the price by the market was $2.80 at that time. It was less than $3. They calculated the true cost to be $15.31 to society. Now, there was an economist named Pigo in the 1920s, and he would provoke, he, what he proposed is a Pigovian tax. He said you ought to put a tax on things that is the difference between the price and the true cost of society. You can do the same thing. They mentioned it for they tried to do it for soda, but they're not really figuring out what the true cost is. They can do it for meat, they can do it. The first step would be just taking the subsidies away before you would impose a tax. The other is more of a distributed leadership structure for healthcare. We've got the various clinical teams, which are the most functional unit of a healthcare organization with a support department over here and maybe a very small governance structure, but you don't have these layered bureaucracies with politicians. Uh, so let's look at individuals real quick. We've still got a few minutes left. The prevention prescription, here's Neil Barnard. You know you've done something when you finally make it into the cartoons, right? <laughs> Welcome to Sweeney's All You Can Eat Barbecue. I'm Dr. Neil Barnard. I'll be your waiter and your cardiologist tonight. <laughs> uh, I heard Jeffrey Smith speak uh, last fall at, uh, he's the guy that knows the most about GMOs, and I've added non-GMO to my baseline prescription for patients of the whole plant food plant-based diet with vitamin, adequate vitamin B12s and fitness, aerobics, strength, flexibility, balance, and stability, fitness as opposed to just one aspect of those, and keeping current. And the best way you can keep current is you can read the McDougal newsletters every month. You can go to nutritionfacts.org and keep up with the science. You've got to find ways to keep current because the science changes, and I'll be the first to admit this could all be wrong. But as you follow the science, and John's done this for longer than anybody and certainly has more clinical experience 
and more success than any clinician I know of in this country. Uh, the science just keeps figuring out why we were right in the first place. But you've got to keep an open mind. You've got to keep an open mind. So let's hear from a couple patients. The first one patient is the Meals for Health patient I took care of. Meals for Health was an outpatient McDougal program we did for 20 people up at the Sacramento Food Bank. Here's Ollie. Oh, sorry, one slide ahead of myself. So you get the opportunity to cast a vote every time you eat. You can cast a vote for better health, less suffering, better environment, and here's a cartoon that says diabetes has increased dramatically over the past 20 years. That proves that diabetes is caused by global warming. <laughs> I mean, the numbers can be a little confusing, and you need to be a little more sophisticated about your statistics, and actually, all the meat and dairy industry is contributing so much to global warming that there is, there is just a little truth in this statement here. Uh, and I want to encourage you, I mean, we need all the help you can get. I know it's hard to work with physicians, but send them like the vegetarian starter kit. Send them, you can get the abstracts. Start to influence your doctors. I give talks to both lay groups and physicians. Also, I give group to, talks to leadership groups. I'm willing to go to talk to any group. Um, but it's important if you can turn a physician, then they can start working with a lot of their patients. And once the doctors start seeing the results in their patients, it's a very rewarding way to practice medicine. It's sort of like I'm, I wrote all those prescriptions all those years, so I come here and even though I occasionally write a prescription, it's like anti-medicine. You know, I'm taking people off medicines and watching them getting help. Very rewarding. And, and the clips will show you how rewarding. So here's Zali if this works. I started having high blood pressure when I was in my 40s. And uh, since then, it was always high, but as I've gotten older, it was getting higher. And so my doctors were monitoring me, and I had been on that blood pressure medicine for over 22 years. This program done something for me that the medical industry couldn't do for me. This program done something for me in four days. Four days, I was off of my blood pressure medicine. You know? Um, when I started it, and four days, uh, we started April the 8th. April the 12th was my doctor's appointment. And I went in there, and uh, she took my blood pressure, because it had been running like 160 over 104, and it was going up, and they had upped my medication. And then when I started this vegan program, it went down, it was 123 over 78. And uh, she says, uh, oh, I think that the medicine that the doctor gave you is working. I go like, no, it, it's, 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 it's the food. And it really was the food, you know? I mean, I've been searching for a long time. I spent a lot of money at the health stores. I really did, uh, trying to find out what was good for me. Uh, I hadn't had pork in like 38 years, but I was still eating chicken and turkey and fish. And uh, I, I wasn't doing too well. I was spending all this money on noni juice. I was spending the money on spirulina, uh, my calcium pills, all this money I was spending. And all I needed to know was that I needed to eat this plant-based, strong, density low diet. It was just so simple. And I'm going like, wow, I, I didn't have that, that one puzzle that was missing. And this, this is it, you know. I don't see myself going back to ever eating the way that I was eating because of the fact that I'm medicine free right now. And I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I don't, I, I, I get up in the mornings and I could just leave my house. I don't have to worry about, oh, did I take that blood pressure medicine? No, I, I'm feeling good right now. I'm feeling really good. Ali also lost 14 pounds in two months. Her cholesterol went down 50 points. They were talking about putting her on cholesterol medicines. The, next, the last patient I want to share with you is Ben, who is a Whole Foods McDougal patient. It's actually one of the first ones I saw. I came to McDougal Immersion in March of this year. Um, when I got here, I type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, really high cholesterol, um, was on two different diabetes medications, Lipitor for my cholesterol, and Lisinopril for high blood pressure. I lost a couple pounds while I was here, and in the last like seven months or so since, I've lost about 62 pounds. <laughs> Completely reversed the diabetes. My waking blood sugars are generally around 75, 80 every day. I stopped taking measurements after three months of those readings. Uh, my life's completely changed. I have tons of energy. I feel fantastic. I can finally beat my six-year-old in a race, which <laughs> is a nice thing.
So I'd like to close with, uh, <clears throat> I give talks at CME talks all the time, and I really can't eat what they usually serve at these CME talks. So here's a heart attack with extra cheese, heart attack with bacon, double bypass, no pickles, hey, where's my diabetes and large stroke? Uh, I want to thank some incredible people, because John's always fond of saying he stands on a lot of shoulders of a lot of people. This is a team effort. We have to collaborate and get together. My wife, Beth, and my home support team, Michael Greger, Neil Barnard, Jeff Nelson, and Ursay, colleagues at the McDougal Clinic, the staff at the McDougal Clinic, who doesn't get enough recognition, recognition for the great job they do, but mainly John and Mary McDougal for the opportunity. All right. And Don, thank you. <laughs> thank you for an uh, excellent presentation. I do have to say that uh, Benjamin was uh, uh, Dr. Forrester's uh, first education of why it's important to reduce medications quickly. Yes. Right? Well, actually, the, 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 the story is that Ben came in and he was on two blood diabetic medicines, and I tried to get him off both medicines, just like John told me. But Ben, had to hang on to a little bit of his metformin. He had to take that last little bit of metformin. He was afraid it was going to get too bad. And I couldn't do anything to change him. But the nice thing about the system of care here is that they get checked every morning. They get blood pressure, they get weighed. And I told him, I said, look, if those sugars, start, you know, if your sugars drop below a certain point, you've got to get in and see Dr. McDougall or see one of the, you know, because I was, I was not going to be there for the next couple of days. So he actually uh, got a low blood sugar and went and saw John. John was able to convince him at that point, plus his own experience, to get off the medication. So John's right. It was a very educational patient for me. And Ben, by the way, is now down over 100 pounds, and he's doing much better. So question. Yeah, I had a friend who uh, was treated for breast cancer and was in that group of 11 people you talked about. And uh, she was doing the, uh, one of the walks and doing a fundraiser for that. And I told her, even though I'm your friend, I, I don't support this, uh, so good luck to you, but the, you know, evidence doesn't uh, say that's a good thing. I showed her all the data that you just presented, and her response was, look, if we could save one life in 2000, that that's worth it. And I didn't have an argument for that. Well, the, argu the argument is uh, that, and, and Gotsi mentions this in the book, is that the treatment for breast cancer has gotten so much better that if you waited to detect the cancer from the time the mammogram found it to the time that the patient felt the lump or a doctor did, that the outcomes would be the same. And if you look at the actual, we've learned a lot about the life cycle of cancer. And I, John McDougall, I use a slide that he was graciously shared that looks, when, you know, when you detect a breast cancer on mammography, it's been there for eight years. You know, you're going to detect it clinically at nine or ten years when the lump, because you've got to remember it starts with one cell and it keeps doubling, and we, we know that now. So probably even if she was that one that was saved, given the current therapy. Now, that, that work hasn't been done yet, but it looks like that's probably going to be the case. So that would be the only thing you could say. But it's hard to change your beliefs. Are you saying that one life would still have been saved later? That the outcome would still be one? What I'm saying is that's a high likelihood. The study hasn't been done at this point. But, it, but, but given the treatment, that may be the case. We learn a lot more about the biology of cancer. And Colin Campbell does nice talks on this stuff. But you know, Hiroshima was a terrible event. But we found out that 18 months later, people started coming down with leukemia. So we know how fast cancers can develop. But most of these other cancers develop very slowly. So it's very difficult to change people. I would say that medical organizations should get those leaflets out to all their, all their patients. But when you send them to the politicians in charge of medical organizations, and I've done this with some of the politicians and organizations that, that I know, they come back and say, oh, it's controversial. But it's not controversial at this point. Yes, sir. Uh, is there a concern with a <clears throat> lot of uh, x-rays, prophylactic x-rays <clears throat> and otherwise, and CAT scans, of association between accumulated x-rays and cancer, or should there be a concern? And also, I just had a brief comment, and that is, on your list of 10, uh, accident, 10 causes of death, I think number 10 would be the 37,000 deaths caused uh, by the highways last year. You're right. Thank you. Uh, you can calculate how many cancers are created by radiation. Uh, <clears throat> And we should use less radiation, there's no doubt about it. What we need to do is develop Ottawa ankle rule type x ray uh, guidelines for like headaches, for instance. Because, what was it, last year, John will know the exact dates, but about a year or two ago, they had a bunch of patients who had gone through ERs and had headache scans, uh, CT scans for their heads for headaches, 
And about six to eight months later, their hair started dropping out. <clears throat> because the, C, the CT scans were not adequately calibrated and they were getting very high doses of radiation. <clears throat> so when you start doing those sort of calculations to calculate how many cancers are gonna come, you are making an assumption that they are adequately calibrated machine, which is a quality problem that could be fixed with total quality management systems if that stuff was tracked. So, yes ma'am. <clears throat> Hi, um, I have Kaiser. I, in general, love Kaiser, but I'm puzzled, and, and I used to actually work for Kaiser uh, in the central office, um, that, which will tell you how long ago it was, for a couple of years. Um, and what I don't understand is, even though I've told my doctor that I don't want to have a mammogram, <clears throat> I've explained to her why I don't want to have a mammogram, Kaiser still seems to feel, uh, there's a program in there, it's called a women's wellness, something or other, and they, they call me up and they, they leave me messages and, they, and they, they make me appointments to have a mammogram. And I kind of don't get this. Why is that? <clears throat> it's, a, uh, it's a bureaucratic organization that pretty well lets the doctors practice their craft and, and information comes from the top down. So <clears throat> I, I would suggest that you send him the booklet and ask, but my wife gets hit for mammograms on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, as a primary care physician, I was evaluated on how, what percentage of women got mammograms. It should actually be the other way around. And, and, and the second thing is they were having ophthalmologists and podiatrists call patients to get them to come in. Because see, the organization is being measured by their percentage of mammography. It's one of the quality measures. We're measuring the wrong things. When I sat down for my last evaluation, I was told that my diabetic control numbers were not quite as good as my colleagues, so I was going to lose a little money on my, my bonus at the end of the year. And I said, yeah, but if you take the 15 patients that I cured and put them into my denominator, my control numbers look very good. And the two people across from the table, a chief of medicine and a chief of chronic conditions, who actually used to be my chief of medicine at the clinic, they looked across the table and they said, you shouldn't have taken them off your panel. And I said, why not? They said, well, the organization is being graded on how are they controlling diabetes, and you're making the organization look bad. I said, I'm not going to label a patient with a diagnosis that they don't have to make the organization look good. This conversation is over. I appealed their, their decision. But, but there isn't, in the electronic medical record system, there's diabetes and there's health maintenance. There isn't status post-diabetes. It's not even a diagnosis. It's not even in our framework, okay? So they don't even think about it. So they can't even track it, okay? So I would just encourage you to keep dodging the system. <laughs> but I also had, I also... I canceled the appointment, but... <laughs> I, I mean, I work there, I, I understand. But, uh, but, and they do a lot of good stuff, but, but in this particular case, get the Cochrane thing and email, we got email, right? Email yeah. your doctor, maybe, maybe he or right. she will read it she, and she, ask to be taken off the list. Uh, you know, we can do this for a lot of things, so yeah. okay, nice comment. You. Uh, I'll be around, John, uh, for the rest of the day. If anybody didn't get a chance to ask a question, I'd be glad to answer it. They can, I've got Don, cards up here. They can email. Two me. more questions, really quick. Okay. Because people would really like to hear from okay. you. Okay. No, that's fine. Three I'll, more. I love real the quick. Real quick. One other common screening exam: colonoscopy. Can you address the efficacy of that recommendation post 50? Which one? Colonoscopy. Okay. It looks like the best data, and I think John would agree with me that maybe one test at 55, 60, or 65 in that range might be useful for you. The literature I know suggests maybe that should, that should be the sigmoidoscopy and not the colonoscopy, okay? And then if they find significant stuff on sigmoid, the next step would be colonoscopy, but one time. But here again, this is in general screening recommendation. And if you take a population of vegans, probably the answer would be no, okay? Unless there was a history of certain types of congenital, like polyposis, poly, we have lots of polyps, it's a congenital abnormality, which is at a high risk for cancer. There are exceptions to all these rules, so you have to work with your physicians on it. But as a general, everybody should get this, bend over and, you know. <clears throat> now, I actually got one, by the way, just personal commentary. Uh, they, they were, I, I figured I needed to do a flig, fl, uh, the short tube, but they were doing a scientific study. So I volunteered to have a colonoscopy. I did it for two reasons. Actually, not because I thought I needed it, but to contribute for the scientific study because I thought it was a worthwhile study, but also so I will have experienced what it was like to have a colonoscopy. Because let me tell you, I don't know who named that stuff called Go Lightly. Yes. <laughs> 
But it's, but it's definitely, uh, it could be done, a quality, it'd be a great quality improvement thing. Because, you know, you got this gallon of stuff, you got to drink a glass every 15 minutes until you're clean. Let me tell you, I was clean after the third glass. And I still have more glasses. And I had patients that were hospitalized for dehydration because they took too much. You know, the, the, it dehydrated them. So, uh, go lightly. I saw that you mentioned um, a non-GMO whole foods plant-based diet, and I've been actually wondering about that because no one's really addressed that this weekend, and I was wondering why you uh, okay. emphasized that. Yeah, the GMO stuff is pretty scary. Uh, Jeffrey Smith, there's a website called the Institute for Responsible Technology. He's got a GMO shopping list. Uh, basically, there are two types. There's the Monsanto will develop corn or soy that, that Roundup won't kill, so they can just spray pesticides over everything and kill, so you get exposed to pesticides. That's not as scary as the BT toxin in some of the, in the corn, because that's an insecticide in each cell of the corn, and it actually kills the insects by punching holes in their intestines. And the studies haven't been done well on this, and the researchers that did some early results were taken out of their positions because of the negative results. But this stuff is certifiably crazy. It's in the food supply, and you need to avoid it. So it's in corn and stuff like that. So. Okay, Don. Well, thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation. You. We'll have, you have a five-minute and 30-second break. That's it. <laughs>